Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxed News Corner. It's good to be back for the second week in a row in our usual Friday slot, but perhaps there hasn't been as much news this week as we'd normally see. I guess it's what tends to happen when we get close to December. The news gets dried up a little bit as companies are mostly focused on holiday sales and preparing for bigger events in 2019 like CES. Still a few interesting stories though, so let's kick things off. First story from this week is more of a rumor that I wanted to get out of the way early because it's generated a bit of discussion. According to some random person on a Taiwanese forum as posted on WCCF Tech, Intel is working on a new generation of S-series desktop processors called Comet Lake that will bring 10 cores manufactured using 14 nanometers. The CPU is also said to use a dual ring bus interconnect and that's basically all the information that was shared. Now on face value, this seems reasonable. Over the past few years, Intel has been steadily increasing the core count of their flagship desktop CPUs from four cores with seventh gen processors up to eight cores with current ninth gen parts. So moving to 10 cores with the future processors sounds about right. Manufacturing the chip on 14 nanometers also is a possibility given Intel struggles with 10 nanometers and without any architectural changes to drive performance improvements, simply adding more cores is one way to speed up a new chip in multi-core workloads. Intel, of course, will need a new CPU to compete with third generation AMD Ryzen CPUs, which have been built on seven nanometers and will use the company's overhauled Zen 2 architecture. There's the possibility these CPUs will pack up to 16 cores with higher clock speeds and major improvements to make them more competitive with current generation Intel silicon. So if Intel can't get a 10 nanometer chip out, they're basically left with no choice but to add more cores on 14 nanometers. But like with a lot of rumors, this one is filled with red flags. Firstly, it's a random post on a Taiwanese forum. I mean, come on, that is not some sort of verified source that has delivered accurate information in the past. Literally anyone can post any rubbish on a foreign language forum. That doesn't mean it's legitimate. And secondly, while the fate of Intel's 10 nanometers is still up in the air, the word from the company at the moment is they are on track to ship 10 nanometer products in 2019. Whether that's a cut down version of Intel's original 10 nanometer plans or the real 10 nanometers is unclear. But at this stage, we're expecting something 10 nanometers next year. Plus it seems Intel has done already all it can do on their 14 nanometer plus plus node. The current Core i9 9900K runs hot and consumes a ton of power and that won't get any better if you try and shove another two cores into the mix. So this rumor doesn't smell quite right to me. I'd certainly be waiting until 2019 to see what Intel has in store. There's another reason why waiting until 2019 might be a good idea. Intel is set to disclose their next generation CPU architecture at an event on December 11th. If Intel are ready to talk about their next architecture, it would certainly be strange to then go and release a new Comet Lake processor on 14 nanometer plus plus that basically just adds two more cores with roughly the same architecture as Skylake. Of course, Comet Lake could be using an overhauled architecture on 14 nanometer. That's a possibility if Intel are gonna use a dual ring bus design. But in the past, Intel haven't bothered to hold architecture events to talk about the minor differences between Skylake, Kaby Lake, and Coffee Lake, instead leaving most of those announcements to the actual product unveils later in the year. You'd think if Intel were holding an architecture event this far ahead of any new CPUs, there would be something interesting to talk about. In any case, the fact the event is relating to CPU architectures means the event is not about GPUs. There were some rumors floating around that Intel would use their December event to unveil their discrete GPU architecture, but those rumors were a load of BS because Intel has confirmed the event is solely about CPUs. With Intel still targeting 2020 for GPUs, it would certainly be too early to be talking about GPUs at this stage, though naturally there's a lot of excitement about what Intel will do in that space. Samsung has launched a new affordable SSD line called the 860 QVO. Yes, QVO. These drives are available in a 2.5 inch form factor and interface over SATA, offering acceptable performance for a budget drive that slots in below the 860 EVO. The name QVO refers to the fact these drives are using new QLC memory, which can store four bits per cell and is set to become the standard across cheaper drives. The cool thing about the 860 QVO line is the drives come at a cost of just 15 cents per gigabyte and are available in one, two, and four terabyte capacities. So the one terabyte model is $150, the two terabyte $300 and the 4 terabyte is $600. Write speeds aren't fantastic due to the nature of QLC, but it's hard to pass up that sort of value if you need a high capacity affordable SSD. 
AMD has launched a new CPU and cooler bundle that gives buyers the beefier Wraith Max cooler with either the Ryzen 5 2600X or the Ryzen 7 2700. These processors normally come with the Wraith Spire or Wraith Spire LED coolers, which are decent enough for a box cooler, but the Max is a fair bit larger and handles overclocking better thanks to its 200 watt heat dissipation rating. In the UK, the Wraith Max bundle costs around 15 to 20 pounds more than the CPU with the standard box cooler. The Wraith Max alone costs £50, so it's decent value if you were after a better air cooler for your Ryzen processor. The bundles are also expected to hit Amazon, Newegg and other retailers soon. Both MSI and Zotac have jumped on board the GeForce GTX 1060 with GDDR5X memory bandwagon. These cards are basically the same as the existing GTX 1060 6GB, right down to core configurations, clock speeds, and even memory clock speeds. So despite the cards using GDDR5X instead of GDDR5, they're still clocked at 8 gigabits per second on the memory. In some ways, that's good news for consumers as there should be no performance difference between the GDDR5 and GDDR5X versions of the GTX 1060. What these new versions will provide is extra memory overclocking headroom. The cards are also reportedly using GP104 silicon rather than GP106, although again Nvidia is cutting this GPU down to GTX 1060 size anyway, so there's no real difference here. The MSI model is called the GTX 1060 6GB Armor OCV1, while the Zotac version has the catchy name of GTX 1060 6GB G5X Destroyer. ASRock has launched a new mid-range X399 motherboard called the Phantom Gaming 6. This new board is designed to sit below the X399 Type-G in ASRock's lineup, but it still includes good features like support for up to 3-way SLI and Crossfire, 3 M.2 slots, dual 8-pin power inputs, and USB-C. The VRM is perhaps the biggest area where ASRock has cut down compared to the Type-G. Here we're looking at, according to ASRock, an 8-phase design. However, ASRock makes it clear in their marketing materials that this board is only designed for AMD's 180-watt Threadripper CPU, so that means everything up to the 16-core 2950X. The more power-hungry 250-watt 32-core 2990WX is not meant to be used with this board, which isn't surprising considering the mid-tier VRM. Although, so you would have to wonder how 2950X overclocking would go on this 8-phase design. There's no word on pricing or availability at this stage though. ASUS is set to launch a new display called the ROG Strix XG32 VQR shortly, packing a 2560x1440 VA panel, a maximum 144Hz refresh rate, and FreeSync 2 HDR certification. However, I don't expect the HDR experience to be all that good considering the panel only conforms to the VESA Display HDR 400 specification and doesn't appear to have local dimming of any kind. Peak brightness only tops out at 450 nits, though there is 94% DCI-P3 coverage, so it will be a wide gamut monitor. No word on pricing at this stage, though for these specs, we're probably looking around the $400 to $500 mark. Final story for this week concerns AMD's Radeon RX 580 2048 SP, which we first covered on the channel in News Corner a fair while back. Well, our mates over at Gamers Nexus managed to get hold of one of these 2048 SP models and confirmed that it is indeed just a pre-overclocked RX 570. The box even lists RX 580 on it, despite performing like the RX 570, so it's very deceptive to say the least. Not good stuff from AMD, though if you are interested to see how the RX 580 2048 SP ended up, head over to Gamers Nexus and check out their full review. That's it for this week's News Corner. Before I go, just want to say a big thanks to everyone that supported the channel over the last few years. We've just passed 300,000 subscribers, which is a neat little milestone for Hardware Unbox. Wouldn't have been possible without you guys clicking on our videos and listening to two Aussies talk about PC hardware. As always, you can subscribe for News Corner around this time every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our monthly live streams and exclusive Discord chat, and I'll catch you in the next one.